Hello everyone, uh, Mike Karaginas here, physical therapist, uh, TMJ, TMD specialist. Wanted to just share some, some things for people to have a better understanding of how the temporomandibular joint moves. This is one of my favorite models that I use on a regular basis for patient uh, explanation. If you can imagine, this is sort of the left side of your jaw. You know, it'd be nice if I could have kind of a three-dimensional model, but this is the left side of your jaw. This here would be, right, your eardrum, your ear canal. Here we have what we call the condylar head of your jaw joint. And of course, this is the part of your skull, side of your skull we call the temporomandibular, or um, I'm sorry, the temporalis uh, bone. And in between the condyle and the temporal bone is the disc. And all of our joints, if relatively healthy, still have a disc that uh, interposes between the condylar head and the temporal bone. One of the things we talk, uh, when we just open our mouth a little bit, we get what's called rotation, and we call the rotation occurring in the lower joint compartment. So basically between the top of the condylar head and the bottom of the disc. So if we just open a little bit, like mostly when we talk, um, you, you know, you won't have too much translation in the joint. When we yawn or we take a big bite of a sandwich or we articulate more and we open wider, not only do we get rotation in the lower joint compartment, but now we get what's called translation in the superior joint compartment. So the area above the disc, but yet below the uh, temporal bone. So minimal movement, is, is sort of like this, very subtle little rotation that will occur, but ideally to open fully, uh, the condyle uh, and the disc will rotate and translate together to about a full opening position, which is roughly in line where this structure here we call the articular eminence. Uh, some of you, if you followed some of my other uh, topics or blogs on my Treating TMJ website, you've heard me talk about hypermobile temporomandibular joints. For those that are hypermobile or sublux, uh, I'm going to move the disc out of the way just for explanation purposes, but that's when the condylar head will actually go on the other side of the articular eminence. So uh, they are translating beyond, let's say, normal joint uh, uh, position or limitation. So this would be an example, again, of fairly normal temporomandibular joint opening uh, mechanics. All right, Mike Karaginas here again, uh, TMJ, TMD specialist and uh, physical therapist. Uh, my prior video, you heard me explain normal temporomandibular joint mechanics. Now I want to give you an example of those of you that might experience some popping or clicking coming from, uh, in this particular instance, because this is how the model is set up, the left side of your temporomandibular joint. So again, you know, you have to keep in mind, right, there are ligaments and capsular tissue and all these things that attach to the disc as well as uh, to the condylar bone and the temporal bone of our skull. But for simplified explanation, what tends to happen over time, it could either be through wear and tear, maybe some kind of facial trauma, nail biting, any kind of repetitive parafunctional habit like nail biting or possibly just clenching and grinding at night due to maybe sleep disordered breathing, additional stresses, things that are going on in our life, uh, we can develop uh, a disc that will migrate slightly forward and it actually will become displaced forward. Now this model won't let me show this, but not only can the disc displace forward, uh, so if this is your condylar head here, not only can the disc displace forward, but it can also displace sometimes medial to the inside or lateral to the outside, Sometimes that disc can completely perforate or split and go in both directions. So there's a variety of things that can actually occur in this joint. But I always like to say the most common patient that seeks treatment tends to be the one where they'll have a, an anteriorly displaced disc or an anterior medial displaced disc would be the more common in the clinic anyway. Uh, so this would be a situation where the disc is slightly displaced forward. And when you go to open your mouth, you will hear and possibly feel a click in the joint. And then what happens is during that moment when you hear that click, the disc has relocated back into its proper position and orientation and protecting the joint. And then that will continue on usually through the full opening phase. Generally, yes, there can be pain with this. Sometimes plenty of people have popping and clicking joints that will pop and click the rest of their life and never progress to a problem.
But if you do experience pain and things like this, then this is something we would want to help you uh, treat and, and help resolve. Uh, and then what we find is upon closure, just before closure, the disc will sublux anterior again and be off the condyle. And uh, we will have what's called sort of an anterior disc displacement with reduction. And the condylar head, based on position, will slightly be more posterior or to the back of the joint and superior, elevate inside the joint. So again, when you, with this disc slightly displaced, when you go to open, you can hear a click. And then you will continue to open fairly normal. And then just upon closure, you will hear a closing click and the disc will sublux forward again. Generally, the opening click is much louder and maybe more abrupt than, a, than the closing click. But in order to be classified as a true disc displacement with reduction, you need to have a closing and an opening click. Now, a lot of times if we can't hear it, uh, I, we will listen with a stethoscope over your ear on both sides and that will help us pick up sounds as well. Sometimes just gently light palpation, you can feel the vibration through the bone. And of course, if you really want to be technical, you know, you could always order an MRI, a closed and open view to get further confirmation of this. But let's face it, with healthcare costs and things like that, that's not always uh, practical or uh, a reality. So that's an explanation of a disc displacement with reduction in the temporal mandibular joint. Thank you. Okay, again, Mike Karajin is here. Uh, TMJ, TMD specialist and physical therapist. Uh, now want, uh, I would like to explain to you what a disc displacement that does not reduce uh, looks like inside of our temporal mandibular joint. So if you've watched the normal mechanics, you have uh, seen the disc displacement with reduction. Now what we frequently see and can tend to be more painful and certainly functionally disturbing, meaning you know, yawning can be difficult at this point. Uh, eating and biting into certain foods can be very painful as your limit, your opening uh, can be limited. When we have a disc displacement that is not reducing, the disc has remained forward and the condylar head cannot get around it. And at some point, this condylar head butts up against the back posterior portion of the disc and that limits your opening. So let's say if normal opening, we generally like to say is between 40 and 50 millimeters. Obviously, you know, there's people with a little bit less, people with excessively more. But 40 to 50 intersizal measurement is, is pretty normal. Not uncommon for people with a disc displacement without reduction to be limited sometimes 30, 32, 35 millimeters of opening. Um, it's a, one of the clinical telltale signs of a disc displacement that is not reducing. Also, it's not uncommon for these people to have a history that my joint used to pop and click, but I could open normally. All of a sudden, I woke up this morning or I had a bagel for, for breakfast, and all of a sudden, uh, the noise stopped, the popping and clicking stopped, but I was also limited now in opening. So when you have a disc displacement uh, that is not reducing, the disc is not reducing, uh, that is because that disc is sort of acting like a doorstop. It's blocking the ability for this bone, the condyle, to translate further forward so you can open normally. Now, you know, there's all kinds of different schools of thought. You know, can you recapture this disc? You know, can you not? Do you need to have surgery? I mean, I can tell you in my 30 plus years of experience, it is very rare, in my humble opinion, you ever need to have surgery here. This can be managed very well with great conservative care, but the challenge remains. There are very few of us between the PT and the dental community that have the credentials and the um, uh, educational skill set to actually help you manage this. So that is still a problem that we are all faced with throughout the US and, and quite frankly, globally. Uh, but eventually, uh, what I hope will happen in time with the appropriate course of treatment is that we will take this disc that is not reducing and we will get it to reduce again. So you will go back to this popping and clicking joint so that at least we know part of the time your uh, disc is in the proper orientation. But the longer that you are in this uh, anteriorly displaced non-reducing position, really the less likely it is that that disc probably will ever somewhat reduce. Um, I don't like to use the word recapture because in my opinion it's only recaptured for a brief moment. I don't want to give the perception that you are recapturing it permanently. Um, but then what uh, we believe happens, and of course we see this on MRI studies, 
is little by little, by increasing the extensibility of some of these structures that can become tight, the disc will continue to move further and further out of the way forward. So I'm going to just, this model won't completely let me move this any further, but imagine your disc will continue to migrate further forward and out of the way, and you will be able to then resume a fairly normal opening. So while you might still have a disc that's displaced and not reducing, most people uh, will achieve very successful, complete pain relief with excellent return of function um, and hopefully not have really any future, future problems uh, with this particular joint uh, because this joint is very resilient. And maybe at some point we'll talk about, you know, why is the temporal mandibular joint so much more resilient, let's say, than our knees and our hips. You know, we rarely have to have joint replacements in the jaw except for maybe major trauma. Uh, but obviously we know the knees and the hips and other parts of our body wear out much quicker. So thank you for the opportunity to share some of this information.